uh, and thank you very much for being here, uh, especially with <laughs> the, I think, well, uh, such a large, large scale installation it was not easy to find a place for it, but I think, uh, and originally meant to be outdoor, uh, but I think presented very properly here in the, the Lichthof, the, the furthest Lichthof in, uh, in the back. So in the corridor, we take, go through the door, we go to the end and there is the work. Uh, there are now and then some problems with the locally rented compressor, uh, but it is permanently monitored, which means that if the installation would not be running for a short second, it will be uh, corrected again. Yeah? Just out of curiosity, who of you has already seen uh, the installation? Okay, that is not so many. Okay, let's see what we do with that. <laughs> um, nevertheless, I want to take the opportunity to to uh, explain to you uh, how, well, my, my curiosities behind the installation, how I got uh, to the idea uh, of the installation, uh, and I will try to also try, uh, well, try to visualize a little bit the approach. Um, but in order to explain everything properly, I go back in time a little bit. Um, I go to a work that is called A World Beyond the Loudspeaker. It's a work that I re realized in uh, 1997, and it's a surface uh, of loudspeakers uh, with a spacing of 30 centimeters in between, uh, on which I uh, initially played, uh, and I still present the work, uh, microphone recordings that are uh, recorded with a grid of 40 microphones. Uh, not indoor uh, recordings, but outdoor recordings. And so the idea is to, uh, I would say it's not wave field synthesis in this case because there's nothing synthesized, uh, but the idea is to make wave field uh, recordings. Uh, I used recordings at four different locations for the work and then to uh, do wave field playback. And what would it lead to? The ideal of this installation would be that uh, the installation uh, forms an acoustic window to another location. Yeah, and where you often see that wave field synthesis is done in, an, in a horizontal line, uh, the same concepts can be expanded uh, vertically. And what would happen is that, uh, and you shouldn't listen as close as that, uh, that she's doing here, but uh, uh, the idea is that the, the spatial uh, shape of the waves are being recorded by the microphones and that the spatial shape of the waves are equally uh, reproduced as they took place in the recording location through uh, the wall of speakers. Um, yeah, and therefore you could, I, I like this metaphor very much, we could make an open window with the same size as this particular installation and we would listen to uh, a scene that is recorded uh, somewhere else. After realizing the work, I thought, okay, but now I should see what happens if I uh, generate signals electronically. So it's the same installation, uh, but I started to simulate uh, sound sources behind and in front of the speaker. Um, and especially I started to simulate moving sound sources. Um, and what I, uh, so I did this uh, in Max, um, but what I you know, immediately started to, to explore with, since I, I, I was using very simple, mostly pulse-based sound sources, is to, to see what happens with the movement, how do we perceive the movement, and uh, yeah, when you have the knobs and the, the possibilities, what happens when you uh, speed things up to the extreme, and when does it fall apart, and what are uh, the properties of the system itself. So it's not so much the ideal of uh, being able to reproduce anything on it, but I, what I started to do is to, to experiment really with the, the, the behavior of uh, the system itself uh, and use that as content uh, for the work. Um, if we travel a bit further then, then we come to pneumatic sound field. Um, and pneumatic sound field originates from uh, a request that I got in 2006 to, and that was not necessarily this location, but in 2006, uh, Sonambiente took place in Berlin, 
and I was asked to develop a work uh, for Ston Ambiente, uh, but as a residency in Tesla, the former Podewil in Berlin. Um, I was curious or integrated by this pergola kind of structure, and uh, I had been doing some experiments beforehand with uh, pneumatic valves, and then you think like, okay, what does this structure have to do with pneumatic valves? Uh, nothing, but I was, I, I simply woke up maybe one day, I have, I have no clue what happened, but I thought, why not try to use a pneumatic valve to produce sound, uh, since sound is a change of pressure in the air. Yeah? So we can, of course, use loudspeakers and moving membranes in order to produce sound, but why would we not uh, use uh, a tank of compressed air uh, and modulate the output in order to produce sound. I experimented with uh, what is called proportional valves that can, where you can really control the opening uh, and discrete valves. Discrete valves are valves where uh, they have just two states, they are closed or open. Uh, at the end, for this installation, I only worked with discrete valves um, and it resulted in a grid of uh, six by seven valves. Oh no, here six by six originally uh, in uh, this particular structure. So you see the horizontal lines above the audience, um, and in each line I placed uh, six pneumatic valves. Uh, here we see the valve itself. Uh, here we see the structure, including uh, the hoses uh, set up over there. Uh, here we see it with people um, from the other side. Uh, here I had to, <laughs> uh, so the idea for the installation came from the location itself. And then I thought, yeah, but it's a work that can also work in other locations. So although it was conceived for that particular site, I started to think about ways to uh, take it apart or take it away from the site and present it in other places. Uh, this is at the Boymans van Benningen Museum in Rotterdam. Uh, same location. And here, first we see a sketch, another sketch. And here we see the realization um, of a huge pavilion. We see the valves sticking down. Uh, that's the same width. And then besides that width, we still have the, the curved uh, sides of the pavilion. This is in front of the National Art Museum uh, of China in Beijing. And here we see that uh, with the audience. Uh, taking their positions in relation to the work. And here we see it uh, from the other side of the street. Um, so, what did I say? I said discrete valves. So, although I had the dream of uh, using compressed air uh, and in combination with a valve as a replacement for loudspeakers, I actually at the end chose for something that can just open and close. Uh, and I would say, but what it results in is one bit audio. Yeah? So it's, we have only two states, so it's off or on. Um, but, uh, so in Berlin we saw the six by six grid. Later on I changed the grid to six by seven. So seven lines of uh, six valves, that's what you see over here. Um, and uh, all the 42 valves are uh, independent. Yeah? So I can work with them independently. So we could say it's 42 channels of one bit audio and really one bit audio. I don't use any kind of uh, microcontroller Arduino kind of uh, interface to control it, which would normally have a very low uh, update rate or low time resolution here. They're really simple, accurate 42 audio channels um, they can open and close very fast. Uh, they can open and close up to 800 times per second, so the highest frequency I will be able to produce is 800 hertz. And nevertheless, the timing accuracy is much higher. It's really uh, simple. Um, and that means that I, sure, I could think about, uh, uh, let's say, make, making an organ and uh, playing different pitches with the individual valves, but what I did is I conceived it as uh, a surface, and a surface where impulses can travel through. Yeah, so, uh, well, one other comment um, 
that I also used in the description in the program book, is that in a sense, since I can only open and close, I cannot create any complicated waveform. So in a sense, you could say that, that the only possibility that I have for composing material, <laughs> creating material for the installation is by doing things in time. Yeah, I have no other possibility. It's only time, in time for the valve itself, and in time, uh, in in the space, in the grid of the 42 valves. Um, what I'm going to show you is a simulation here. Uh, well, it's not a simulation. It's the actual uh, patch, the actual software that I made for it. And what we see here uh, is one. Imp uh, 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 we don't see it. Sorry, we have to. Stop this. Yeah. Let me go back. There we are. Um, and what we see here is a square wave that is the sound source that is originating from outside of the structure. So this is a top view of the structure. Um, and in time, uh, traveling through the grid. And in this particular case, we, so we see the pulse, it's a square wave, so we have an on and an off. Um, and we have a particular, so we have a particular position, but also we have a particular frequency. In this case, we have a particular pulse width and the duration of the, the pulse, or the, uh, we can also uh, express it relatively. Um, but very important, we also have a speed, a speed with which the, uh, the square wave from the sound source is traveling through the grid. Yeah? And this is something, uh, over here I'm playing three different compositions on the installation. This is really something that I'm using. Um, but what am I interested in here? I'm interested not so much in this uh, pattern only, I'm interested in playing with the parameters, and these are parameters that, so this installation is absolutely not a wave field synthesis installation, but I play nevertheless a bit with parameters that are related to it. Uh, normally, if this would be wave field synthesis, it wouldn't work because the distances are way too big, etc. But um, if it would be, uh, I have to simulate uh, and work, do my calculations with the actual speed of sound to, in order to be able to create uh, certain patterns. Here I can simply change the particular speed and I can say okay well I'm interested in uh, the zero which means the infinite speed of sound and everything happens at the same moment in time uh, and logical yeah so we just get this would we even can listen to it a little bit it would sound like this yeah, and sounds would be open and closed. Um, I cannot play you the, uh, the moving examples, but what I can then do, so here we have an infinite speed of sound, then I could play with the actual speed of sound, which means that I can be standing somewhere and that uh, if a movement would come like this, or if a sound source would be positioned over there, that the sound from all the valves at my particular position, that's not at all positions, would arrive at the same time. Yeah, so position matters very much in the installation, so the way you perceive things it's very dependent on where you are in space. Or um, I can slow it down where, uh, for example, the valves that are far away, nevertheless the pulses from them would arrive at me first and then the other ones would arrive later and I can create transitions. Yeah? So in this case with the infinite speed of sound, of course, the nearest valve will be the, uh, the position where I localize the sound, where the sound appears to come from. But then when I start to manipulate this and play around with it, I can start to invert it and it can be that actually uh, a far away position can be the, uh, perceived as the origin of the sound uh, simply because of um, uh, simulating the movement with a very slow speed of sound. Um, yeah, so the, the very fast things I cannot uh, show you here. Uh, what I do and what's important in the work, what I, what I will show you is I work a lot with moving sources. So here we should see the pattern that is... Ding, ding. 
Yeah, so we see that the, the origin of the sound source is changing, so we get different patterns. I work with different speeds, and uh, of course I do this, and this will lead to a rhythmical result because of the low frequency, but this also works with pitches, and I create this continuum between um, uh, sounds that are intended to be rhythmical, sounds that become rhythmical because of the uh, slow speed of sounds, and uh, sounds that uh, then are pitched, but, for example, fall apart because of the slow speed of sound, or that really get together because of, a, let's say, a normal speed of sound or a higher speed of sound. And again, using that as a parameter uh, in the composition. Um, yeah, and what was I say? I had something more about that. <laughs> I forgot. Um, I'll move on then. Uh, this so far for how the, the material is being generated. Uh, we go back to the presentation to finish. Oh, not from start. That was a nice idea, but... I want to show you one other work. Uh, it has a German title simply because of how I uh, like uh, the two words. It's called Schwingungen, Schwebungen. Schwingungen, in this case, because of vibrations, uh, Schwebungen because of uh, the word uh, interferences, and because these words are very close to each other, I took these uh, as a title for the work. Um, and in this particular work, which uh, looked like this, this was presented uh, until a year ago uh, outdoors in front of the University Library in Bonn. Here I again used uh, pneumatic valves. Um, I didn't work at all with time differences. Uh, I worked with, uh, indeed, with interferences, so slight detuning, for example. But uh, there are two things very different and that I don't want to, uh, I want you to know about them. First of all, although the valves that I use are again tiny, uh, I use, in this particular case, uh, two types of horns. We see the huge wooden horns um, and we see uh, five uh, U-folds. So here we see uh, the circular and the UFOs, they are a circular horn that are driven from the middle. Why do I use uh, these two types of horns? Because in the installation that I'm presenting here, uh, although I have a lot of pressure, um, the pressure mainly becomes wind and only partially sound. Uh, so what's in technical terms, uh, there's not a good matching between the energy on the output and the acoustical sounds. It's called impedance matching. And the horns, they do help to uh, translate all the pressure or all the energy that's coming out of the valve into acoustic pressure. Um, and I did that with very huge ones to uh, be able to produce really strong low frequencies and the circular ones uh, to create an om omnidirectional uh, form of sound production. And here we see the wooden one from the back. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much, Edwin van der Heide. Uh, are there any questions? This is the occasion. <laughs> 30 seconds. At this exhibition, what can we hear from you? Well, uh, so the previous, the, the pneumatic sound field, yeah? So it's okay. in the back, okay. uh, so you really see the, the full structure, 10 by 20 meters, uh, 4 meters above the audience, with the 42 it pneumatic valves. It is running continuously. Okay. Uh, it's a composition that exists out of three pieces, uh, and in total, the three pieces uh, are, I think, about 12 minutes together. So in 12 minutes, you should get the full experience. Oh, great, and it's running continuously. It's running continuously. Okay, thank you. Except that now and then we have some compressor problems, and then the compressors just restarted. And yeah, yeah. Keep yeah. On going. Con congrats! Yeah. It's <laughs> wonderful idea. I really, I li really love it. Thank you. Hey, Edwin. Um, I uh, was really, I love the piece, and uh, what I was struck about it was the uh, um, 
the wide variety of timber that, that you uh, uh, arrived to get. And I was wondering if that was something that was a byproduct of a really formal study of the uh, rhythmic pitch continuum, or if it was something that you sort of studied and cataloged and then, and then really used as part of the composition. The, there are two reasons, I would say, for the temporal changes. Uh, partially, it has to do with the, if I, if I produce an impulse, it has to do with the opening time, so the duration of the impulse, yeah, the opening time of the valve. Uh, so with that, I can create different, uh, well, you could say, comp filter kind of effects. Uh, but there's a second reason uh, why it happens, and the second reason is that I, uh, at certain moments, I really work very close to the actual speed of sound, which leads to phasing uh, differences between the valves, and uh, it's the moment where you cannot separate uh, the sound from the individual valves, so it really sounds as if it's one impulse uh, with uh, a particular spatial experience, and while that's and you hear it move, but although you localize it somewhere, uh, so you have a distinct sensation of where the sound comes from or where the sound is in space, that, that particular sound is actually generated by all the valves together. And it's, the, for example, the phasing and the very small time differences that lead to actually quite large uh, temporal differences. I have one question. Uh, what, uh, what, what kind of evaluation would you say, uh, what advantage does this wow uh, have? <laughs> um, it's a good question. Um, yeah, so if we would speak from a generic kind of perspective, uh, the valve will be useless. Uh, it's a, it, has, it doesn't come any, uh, in any way close to uh, what we can do with the speaker. But, um, I would say that, so I mean, so you could say I was simply interested in the principle and exploring it. Uh, of course, the evaluation is an important question because how do we experience it and is it interesting? Is it interesting to use it in a generic way? Maybe not. Is it interesting for me to use it? I think very, very much um, because of, uh, in, in my opinion, the sensation of the sound is very different than the sensation of sounds from a speaker. And it, uh, it somehow has a much more direct uh, bodily impact uh, than the sound from the speaker. On the other hand, if you're not underneath it, it disappears quicker. Yeah? So a speaker, in a sense, even if, if it's broad or directional, in, independently of whether the speaker is broad or directional, a speaker uh, uh, has an effect on the, on the, on the larger range, but the pneumatic valve, being close to it, has a very direct uh, physical impact, impact uh, which in this particular case, although we hardly see anything, we have very small valves that we don't maybe even recognize as valves, has, uh, creates a very strong sensation of presence. And so we have this huge setup of which we don't know what it is because it's mainly just aluminum truss material. And then in that uh, strangeness of truss material, we have a very, very strong and direct uh, and present uh, experience of sound, and that's something I like very much. And as a person, I like very much to, in a particular work, take just a couple of aspects and from there try to develop an artistic language, a compositional language to work with it. And I think uh, I've been doing that in a successful way in this piece. Any more question? I have one, but someone else has one. <laughs> Okay. Hello there. Could you elaborate a little bit about your choice of, of not having the uh, continuous valves? Um, I see this a little bit like a, uh, uh, a, a big study on, in, in pulsar synthesis and, and uh, with different kinds of pulses you could create uh, probably different kinds of timbres, so yeah. I would believe. Uh, Absolutely. What, what are your thoughts? So, sure. I mean, technically I, I would be able to do uh, quite a bit more with the continuous valves. Um, for the content of the piece, I thought that I simply didn't need it. But I have to admit, and I didn't mention it, that for this particular work, I did not only add the horns to the valves, but here I did use the proportional valves, so where I can create the opening in a continuous way. Why? Because I didn't want uh, to be limited uh, to uh, the sharp pulse type of sounds. Yeah, square wave, whatever, pulse kind of sounds. And here, uh, it's very different. I can make any kind of waveform, 
uh, and I intentionally work much more with uh, sounds without any overtone, sine waves, uh, and a very, very different uh, type of sound. But you're right, of course it gives more possibilities, but the question to me was simply, do I need them? And I thought, no, I don't need them. Yeah. And I have one question. You started to talk about the content, the composition, yeah. uh, which, uh, but you in introduced one principle, the principle yeah. of propagation or movement of the yeah. sound. Yeah. What uh, can you say something more about uh, the, the, your intentions or your, the composition material you are, you are using? Yeah. So uh, in the composition, I stay very, very close to the principle that I, I just presented. Uh, so it's a question again of what is the range that this, so I have the, the valves that are limited, discrete valves. I use this principle of uh, propagation, position and speed uh, through the speed of sound through the grid. And what I mainly did is to explore what kind of different uh, sensations I can create with this particular setup. And from there think how, how I can use that in a compositional way. Yeah, and then you see that, um, and again, I stay very close to, to the, the very basic possibilities. Yeah, so just to give you an example, uh, we can say the valves are normally closed and then I open them. But there are two moments uh, where I invert the situation and I say, no, no, all the valves are open and I only close them at particular moments. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> it's playing with these things and just from there, see, seeing if I can create big enough contrasts so that I can uh, create uh, an interesting enough composition that is very close to uh, what the valves themselves are. So for all of you who stay until Sunday, the installation will be up uh, the entire Sunday, so there will be plenty of time for exploration. Thank yeah. you, Edwin. Thank you.